For the audience who is here and the ones who are still coming in, uh, welcome to the November 20th lecture for the Amherst History Society's Noontime Lecture Series, History Bites. Uh, you should know that this lecture is made possible with the help of Amherst Media, who will record the presentation and the recording will be available on Amherst Media's website and the Amherst History Society will also link to it on our website. So today we'll learn about June 19th or Juneteenth. Uh, many believe that Juneteenth commemorates the end of slavery for all enslaved people in the United States with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. But in fact, the United States was still at war with the Confederacy when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. And it took more than two years for the United States to defeat the Confederate States and for word to reach the enslaved people uh, in isolated parts of Texas. Many slave owners there resisted and refused to free their slaves until the US Army General Gordon Granger announced on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston that the slaves had been freed and that the former slave owners had better get with the program. In Massachusetts, the day had been recognized with an annual proclamation, but it was not a legal holiday. This year, as June 19th drew near, our guest, Dr. Amalkar Shabazz, decided that this was the good time. He said, Massachusetts recognized it as a special day, but it was not a true holiday. So he contacted Senator Joe Comerford, as well as state rep representatives Bud L. Williams and Mindy Dong, and cut to the chase, the Juneteenth Amendment passed unanimously on the House floor and was signed into law on July 24th, making Juneteenth Independence Day an official Massachusetts state holiday. So our speaker, Dr. Shabazz, joined UMass in 2007 and has twice served as chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies. He continues to teach in that department with an emphasis on the political economy of social and cultural movements, education, and public policy. His book, Advancing Democracy, African-Americans and the Struggle for Access and Equity in Higher Education in Texas was the winner of the T.R. Ferenbach Book Award and other scholar has other scholarly recognitions. Dr. Shabazz has been a Fulbright senior specialist and has done work in Brazil, Ghana, Japan, Cuba, and other countries. He was selected for the 2014 to 15 class of the American Council on American Fellows Program. So please welcome Dr. Shabazz. Thank you, so glad to be here for History Bites. And um, if I can, at this point, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> go ahead and share screen. And away we go. I'd um, title these remarks today after uh, a, uh, actually a book project that I have going uh, called um, Juneteenth, uh, The History of a Day. And um, <clears throat> as was already uh, mentioned in the opening, we're talking about um, a day that uh, this next year on the 19th of June, the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth will be celebrating it as a full-blown official state holiday. Uh, in the past, it actually has been a recognized day uh, that uh, uh, is an important day, but it will be an official state holiday. And so in getting ready for it, we thought we, we'd uh, uh, talk a little bit about it and I'll, um, about this day, why its significance uh, extends beyond Texas where, uh, or Texas and Oklahoma and the West, where it is more uh, uh, associated, more known and, and grew up and, um, and, and why it, it is, uh, a day of, of national or even international significance that is very appropriate for us to make an official holiday here in Massachusetts. Uh, what you see here is the historical marker in, uh, uh, that's located in Galveston, Texas. 
where uh, uh, the event we mark as the 19th of June, as Juneteenth, uh, took place. Um, Galveston is an island uh, that is uh, uh, near the big metropolis of Houston, Texas, but actually in 1865, it was the big metropolis. It was the largest city in, in Texas, uh, larger than the state capital, larger than uh, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, other El Paso, other big cities we know in, in Texas today. This was the place. Um, it uh, had a had a port that was where a lot of the commerce, indeed, even the slave trade uh, came through. And this is where cotton, mo uh, most of the cotton of Texas at that time went, went out to the world from. And, uh, and so it was a very important uh, place, but um, the, uh, to the whole uh, uh, cotton empire, the slave empire, as it were. And so um, uh, the we're going to talk a bit about the uh, significance of that day and how it's been celebrated and why it's been celebrated. I want to first of all say that um, okay that the uh, the U.S. military uh, presence in the West is what ended slavery. Uh, congressional abolition of slavery in the capital of Washington, D.C. back in April of 1862 only freed uh, people in, in the District of Columbia. Um, the preliminary proclamation, uh, Emancipation Proclamation of September of 1862 did not end slavery, did not end slavery for anybody. Um, the states that were uh, targeted in that preliminary pro proclamation were all in rebellion by that point. And so uh, the, the drafting of it, the preliminary uh, word of it affected no one, no one whatsoever. You can say it signaled things and historians like to talk about it. It signaled certain things, but it had no actual effect on freeing anybody. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation itself of January 1, 1863, did not end slavery for anybody. Once again, it did not end slavery. It did not free anyone. Again, it signaled the resolve of the executive of President Abraham Lincoln. It signaled the resolve of the federal government that in the midst of this war, that uh, they were prepared to use uh, African-Americans, uh, to admit African-Americans into the armed forces for the fight, that uh, they were uh, and that freedom would be a reward of those who participated in, of African-Americans who participated in, in the struggle. So it, it, it had great historical uh, implications uh, for both the war effort for the, and for African-Americans, but again, it actually freed no one. No one was affected on January 1, 1863 by this proclamation. And finally, the Treaty of Appomattox in 1865 did not end slavery. It ended a war, but it did not end slavery. Okay, No one was directly affected by that treaty in relation to if they were still being held in, in slavery, if they were enslaved, they were not immediately affected by the Treaty uh, of Appomattox. Okay, What ended slavery? was when U.S. military forces actually conquered, subdued, and occupied areas where slavery was taking place and made it known that if slaveholders continued to, uh, to, to deal with and treat African Americans as their property, as shadow property, that they would face the consequences of the U.S. military. That's what ended, what ends slavery, okay? And so when it so the the uh, arrival of Union troops in Galveston on this day and the reading out of this proclamation on Monday, June the 19th of June, that has immediate effect, has immediate effect on slaveholders right there in Galveston. And it begins to have immediate effect as word is telegraphed out and word appears in newspapers and word begins to spread that the Union Army is here and the deal is up. This day marks the beginning of the end of the United States of America 
as a slave society. And in my humble opinion, it is most appropriate to become the day in which we officially mark and officially commemorate the beginning of the end of the United States as a slave society. Pictured here is one of the uh, champions of the fight against slavery in the United States. It's a statue right here in, uh, in Massachusetts, in uh, Newburyport, uh, the, uh, the birthplace, the home, boyhood home of, um, uh, of Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison. Um, William Lloyd Garrison uh, has a very interesting story, but um, the, uh, what I want to particularly uh, share with you, uh, and my image here is not showing up quite well, but um, the article here that appears in the Boston Globe um, is the, commemorating the, uh, the beginning of this, uh, the placement of this uh, statue of Garrison uh, in, in Newburyport actually refers to it as uh, reparations. That it was reparations that Newbury's port was finally paying to Garrison, to the memory of Garrison, to the legacy of Garrison uh, that was long overdue. What was the crime that, that what was the harm that was done to Garrison by Newbury port uh, that owed, whereby he was owed reparations and this monument to him was the beginning of a, of a kind of, 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 of repayment and, and uh, repair of the harm that had been done to Garrison. Garrison was never enslaved. Garrison worked to help free those who were enslaved, but he himself was never enslaved. What was the, the great harm? And the great harm actually didn't even take place in Newburyport, per se. Uh, it took place in Baltimore, Maryland. Garrison, in running uh, a uh, move there to, uh, uh, as he had developed in the trade of, of, of being a printer, newspaper uh, publisher and editor, uh, had moved there to uh, uh, publish a, uh, a, a newspaper that was helping to promote the anti-slavery cause in, in Maryland, a slave, a slave state itself, as well as, you know, out to the nation from there. And uh, in one of the issues of the paper, he was, he complained about Newberry's port and about a particular uh, individual there that uh, had profited from the slave trade and was very profoundly involved in the slave trade. And, um, and we was really just trying to be fair to say that, you know, slavery is not only a Maryland problem, it's not only a, a problem of the South, and, uh, and in terms of the implication, those, those who are implicated by it are not only those who are the actual slaveholders in the South, it's all the people who work with them. It's all the people who finance and, finance and trade uh, uh, relations and, and so on that work with the slaveholders that uh, are also equally implicated. Well, the individual he, he named in that article, uh, resident, a very prominent and wealthy resident of Newburyport, uh, filed suit and as a result uh, for libel and uh, the judgment went in his favor. And for that, um, Garrison was given a six month sentence in incarceration in jail, prison, whatever you call it. He had to go to jail for six months. Well, one of his comrades, one of his colleagues in the abolition movement, Underground Railroad, pay, paid the fine against his own wishes, but paid it off so that he could get out in seven weeks. But he did seven weeks, okay? And for that is what this article in the Boston Globe, uh, big full page, almost full page article, heralds the, this monument as an act of reparations for, for dear old Garrison for the, uh, the seven week bid that, uh, that he did in the penitentiary for, uh, for libel. 
Here I want to jump to another uh, a story from the Globe. The Globe had a little little section um, that was uh, entitled uh, "Trying to Move This." This is obstructing me here on the Zoom. Okay, um, and it cites uh, in this daily gossip. It cites an article from a newspaper in Mobile, Alabama, the Mobile Register. And it learned that a white man is swindling the Negroes of Mississippi with the statement that the Emancipation Proclamation by Lincoln has been burned at Chicago and that it will require a large amount of money to get up another and that unless the thing is done so, slavery will be restored and they will all go back into servitude. Now, um, we don't know how much uh, this article is kind of like, I, there used to be a, an article in some papers called News of the Weird, and uh, it may have been kind of tongue in cheek, it may have been actually uh, deadly serious, but the point that I raise it here is again how um, in many instances, uh, uh, the the Emancip Procl Emancipation Proclamation is what is one um, uh, uh, symbol, is one historical reference point that is uh, that is handed down and 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 promoted as the as the really significant uh, uh, reference point for the ending, for, for the freeing of African-Americans and as a reference point for the end of, uh, the beginning of the end of the United States as a slave society. I really want to challenge that, even though that has been a very popular story, has been a part of the popular storytelling. Uh, part of, in my argument for Juneteenth, I really want to, to challenge uh, that and in, in the way it's been, it's been deployed. To show just over time some of the ways in which um, Juneteenth has manifest, and once again, this Zoom bar is in my way and my cursor is not working so well. Well, let me proceed. Um, this is again from the Boston Globe. And uh, what, one of the things, just did a basic search on this to look up the word Juneteenth uh, in the historical uh, Boston Globe. And um, one of the uh, sources that comes up in 1986, we see that uh, out West, um, Juneteenth is the date um, for uh, uh, celebrating the the uh, the end of uh, of slavery uh, in, in U.S. as the beginning of the end of slavery as a U.S. society. Now, in this case, as the article shows here, uh, the celebration had been marred by a an incident with the uh, with the police, of which at the very end of the article we 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 are left with uh, that it is a conundrum. No one knows why there you know this broke out. Why there was the this. Uh, uh, of uh, a fighting and attack and and with with bottles being thrown and, and officers uh, being shot uh, it's left as a mystery in this uh, United Press International article but um, we we nonetheless find that it all ended well on the on the uh, at the close of it by a nice gospel music concert and and peace and calm being restored to to Denver but you can see that thousands are involved in these celebrations. Thousands are involved on Friday night in, in battling with the, uh, with the police. Uh, and uh, uh, even more than that have been involved in the more peaceful activities of celebrating uh, Juneteenth in, in Denver. But, um, uh, but this, is, this is back in 1986. So it's moved out of Texas and Oklahoma and is now a, uh, a something that becomes very prominent in Western states, uh, especially uh, going into the 70s, into the 80s. It uh, hasn't moved quite as much east of the Mississippi, uh, but, it's, but, that's, but that's coming. 
Here from the Globe, we see an article from 1958. Uh, it involves the uh, Sue Thurman, the wife of the, uh, the great uh, educator and, and theologian and scholar Howard Thurman, who at this time is a dean at, uh, uh, in, in Boston, uh, at Boston University. He is the dean of Marsh uh, Chapel. And, um, and she is busy in her own right as a, uh, as an, as a scholar and an activist. Um, she, in the article here, tells the story, Dorothy Crandall tells the story that Mary Beard, uh, the great historian and scholar and uh, partner of Charles Beard, the historian and scholar, um, together they wrote many, uh, many works of history together, um, that uh, at a cup of coffee uh, at, um, with uh, Mary McLeod uh, Bethune, she looks at her and says, set your organization to hunting for Americana. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune in, in this setting uh, was the uh, founder um, and uh, uh, key person with the uh, uh, Council of Negro Women, um, as National Council of Negro Women. And uh, Beard is giving her some advice, um, saying, uh, you know, get that history. This is 58. Get that history before it's, before people die and, and it's lost. And um, and and the and, and said that we gladly will welcome the treasures you find at the World Center for Women's Archives in New York. So she was prepared to to help. Uh, materially in preservation work uh, if McLeod would get women in the uh, National Council of Negro Women to, to do this work. And, and so it was taken up, uh, as she says, in a palatable approach to history uh, by editing this work that uh, is published, this cookbook that is published entitled uh, The Historical Cookbook of the American Negro. And uh, it's organized chronologically. So it starts with January 1, and it begins to give uh, dishes uh, that you could prepare, recipes that you could prepare from January 1 all the way through to, to uh, uh, December 31st. And, um, and so it starts out there in January 1, and it moves along. And I take it from the article. It's not 100% um, clear, but I take it from the article that um, the, I can't see because of this Zoom thing, but um, that um, uh, for the June 19th, uh, the recipe was, uh, as provided here in the article, was barbecue veal roast, barbecue veal roast. And, um, and so Crandall, in writing about this, uh, you know, is curious, well, what's this June 19th barbecue recipe. What's this June 19th all about? And so uh, Ms. Thurman, uh, Mrs. Thurman proceeds to educate her that um, yes, while uh, we start in, and they would inter interweave history uh, with the recipe. So they start with January 1, noting that New Year's Day is the date of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, Day. And, and she notes that it's everywhere except Texas and Oklahoma is they celebrate it as Emancipation Day. But in those states, uh, they celebrate on June 19th and call it Juneteenth. So giving her a little explanation, but, uh, uh, but what's really uh, telling here is, I could use some help to get this Zoom thing out of my way because it's, right in the way of what I'm trying to, to read. I guess you can see it on your end, but um, the, the answer that uh, Crandall is, is told that, um, you know, in, in, is, as um, Ms. Thurman, uh, explains the, uh, the Juneteenth. She says, legend says it took that long, with a laugh, note, it took that long for the word to get to African-Americans, people of African descent in Texas and Oklahoma, 
um, uh, it took that long to, to, to for it to get to them from from 1863. So from January 1, 1863 to June 19, 1865 is how long it took for the word to get to those those poor old old, old uh, African Americans in Oklahoma and Texas. But then she says, whatever the reason, they're not changing now. The recipe for barbecue will, uh, veal is a flavorful way to cook uh, the rolled veal shoulder. It's the favorite of the Houston Council. So I read from that, speaking of the Council of National Council for Negro Women in, uh, um, in Houston, Texas, must have sent in this historical recipe to uh, Mrs. Thurman uh, for the book. They put it in for the June 19th entry. And then we have to get this little, as, as Dorothy Crandall interviews her about it, we get this little uh, kind of jokey uh, uh, jokes. We got jokes for, for Juneteenth and for African-Americans in, in Texas and, uh, uh, and Oklahoma and the West that they're, they so stubbornly fix on, on this day that was uh, that, that's so sad that it took that long. Now, mind you, um, since this is all about history and all about uh, this, really kind of bites uh, what's what's going on in that little story uh, with Mrs. Thurman. It really kind of bites, uh, and it bites a couple of different ways. So, first of all, it bites with this notion with notion that I hopefully I, you know already clarified and and, and straightened out that. There's no uh, uh, problem of African Americans getting the word in January 1, 1863 in, in Texas. Undoubtedly, telegraphs were, word went out, people covered it, probably the, the, uh, um, uh, the white press would have covered it in Texas that this, that old crazy old Lincoln has done this now. News was out, African Americans, those literate would have read it. Those not would have probably heard something, would have been listening out and heard something. But operationally, you knew, but what, what difference does it, did it make? The slaveholders who had the, the power to keep you enslaved, that had the guns, that had the numbers to keep you enslaved, you walk up to them and say, oh, well, Lincoln has freed me now. I'm leaving the plantation here. You're just going to be a dead African-American. So to make these kinds of jokes, and they still go on today, to make these kinds of jokes about, oh, look how it, it took them, you know, since from eight, January 1, 1863, they don't get the word till, 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 till June 19th. Oh, how, how tragic and how, how sad of those, those, those Negroes in Texas and, and, and out West. Not realizing why. Why? It's not about not getting the word. It's about the word was meaningless, was meaningless until the armed might of the U.S. military with a half million, with a, nearly a half million African-Americans ultimately in uniform in that army is what, what makes it a fact, what makes it a reality. Not just that somebody wrote something with a pen and, and whether the word got to someone about it. So it bites that way. But then the other way it bites is, and then it's like, oh, these, these Negroes out West, how, how, how terrible that they're just so stubborn that they cling to the June 19th date and not get in line with everybody else with, June, with January 1. It bites again. Because the, the reality of insisting upon June 9, January, uh, June 19th over January 1 is about the reality, not the rhetoric, not the propaganda, not the, fan, the wonderful story of good old Abe Lincoln and what he did, but about the material fact of when the chains are fully broken, when the last chains are fully broken. And that's out in the West where the word had yet to, had yet to really get. We could raise about how some of the northern states that were untouched by the proclamation really didn't end until 1866 and the ratification. But in the in the case of of, of Delaware or whatever, you know, you're talking you're not talking very many people. You're not talking very many people that um, 
uh, were really materially uh, in, 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 in chains in the way uh, uh, folks were uh, in Texas and in the, in, in, in the rest of the South. You're talking about people who were, st were still being um, uh, uh, referenced and, and, and used as property, and, uh, but uh, um, and, and affecting a very tiny number. But the real material fact of the ending of the institution, the beginning of the end of the institution, is signaled by the uh, uh, the action by by the nineteenth of June. Um, finally, to uh, bring this up uh, to the to a little bit of a local turn, um, because um, to sketch this out, so African Americans are consistently celebrating the 19th of June. They don't wait for any, any, any government. They don't wait for the US military. They don't wait for anybody to tell them about this date. They take it. They take it and claim it. And every 19th, it doesn't matter what day of the week it falls on, they're not working. They're off work that day, self-declared. And that's another powerful thing about this day. This is not a top down, you know, uh, uh, Washington DC down thing. This is bottom up. This is grassroots. People take this day and they use it to reconnect with their families, family reunions, for, to party, to enjoy, to fellowship, to commemorate. Over time, the politicians do get involved and they will sometimes pay for the soda pop, the red soda pop. They will pay for the barbecue. They will pay for, for some, you know, or, or make some contribution toward it. Uh, um, but the, uh, but again, the overall control of it and meaning of it is not the politicians running for office who wanna who wanna try to get votes or 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 signal, you know, their that that they're they're okay with the with the blacks. Uh, no. This is about people taking that day for what it meant for them. And they will do it. And you can look at the historical record. Uh, uh, I've looked in the, uh, the black press, especially uh, out of Texas, out of other places. And you can see it being celebrated the June 19th uh, or and sometimes the entire weekend. If it was a Friday and people are partying the whole weekend in the name of Juneteenth. If it's a Sunday, the parties will start like in, in, uh, in, in Denver, will start on a Friday all the way through to the, to the June 19th day on a, on, a, uh, uh, on a Sunday or a Monday. But consistently, uh, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, 1910, 1920, you can see Juneteenth. You can run in historical black papers and you can see references to it. You can even see references to it outside of the South, outside of the West. Chicago Defender will talk about it. People who are from those areas will sometimes take the, take the, the, the date and the meaning of the date to, to Illinois, to Midwestern states, and, and it'll be mentioned sometimes that this is going on and, and uh, because people are you know, deciding to just do it in, in connection with the, uh, what's done out West, what's done in Texas, Oklahoma and out West. Um, and, and so you consistently see it. In trying to look for it specifically here in, uh, in, 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 in Massachusetts, particularly here in Western Mass where we are, it, uh, it, takes, a, it takes a while. Uh, uh, the uh, beginnings of acknowledging it as a, uh, as a date uh, of, of historical significance um, uh, happens um, back in the uh, some years ago, but, but again, not as an official state holiday. And you start seeing references in, in uh, um, Springfield, in, uh, in, in Amherst, in the 2000s. Um, when I moved here in 2007, I didn't see much going on on that day. We did things just as a fam my family and friends would come together, but we really began to see it take off in um, uh, around 2010 here in Amherst. And uh, I'd particularly like to, to acknowledge two uh, uh, individuals with uh, backgrounds as, as uh, labor union activists and uh, uh, community activists, 
uh, Vera Cage, Vera Doamini Cage, and, and Edward Cage um, had pulled together an event out in Groff Park, uh, a family fun day uh, on Juneteenth. And originally they were wanting to hold it in, uh, in South Point, South Point in some of the commons area there in the South Point uh, uh, apartments. But um, the, as things moved along and the organizing of it, and a lot of people worked with them, it wasn't just the two of them, but many other people worked with them, they, um, uh, they, they opted to, to go to Groff Park instead. And when I read that uh, some press release about this was happening, uh, of course, we had to be there. We went out to it, and, uh, and that's actually where I first met uh, the cages. So, um, and then from there, we've been consistently holding uh, 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 Juneteenth observances every 19th of June uh, here in Amherst. And what we tried to do, and one of the important things as I um, close up on, on, on talking about this, is to really take it as an opportunity to commemorate uh, those who uh, fought to, to end slavery, who fought in the war itself, uh, as well as uh, the, the, the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist anti-slavery movement, those who fought uh, uh, in, in, in that format, but then those who actually then fought in the, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the military itself. Those are often the ones in many of these celebrations that are, 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 uh, are recognized, things are done to, to recognize their songs that come out of Juneteenth and, and often that'll be part of the theme is to recognize the likes of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and old Nat Turner and, uh, uh, and the, the, the fighting 54th and uh, the, the, the soldiers that took part in that. Um, so there are many that ways and, and, and so specifically here, we raise up uh, in our celebrations, we raise up Henry Jackson. Uh, Henry Jackson, uh, no stranger, I'm sure, to, to folks watching History Bites, but um, he was a, um, as it says here in this uh, drawing that was done, was a truckman. He was uh, worked in the li at the livery, uh, um, transporting people, moving people around. He was a great horseman um, and, um, and just known as a really solid person. But even prior to his service in the Civil War, he was at war with slavery. When uh, the young girl, uh, uh, Angeline Palmer, whose uh, own mother, uh, when the time she was born, was, uh, was so destitute that uh, they were, were declared paupers. They were uh, uh, declared, um, you know, they take the child from the mother and uh, declare her a ward of the, of the state um, and um, of the town. And as done in that time, um, I guess it would be equivalent of our foster care system or foster care arrangements, they arranged for a family to, to take her in. And uh, as part of taking her in, of course, they'd help that family out as a, as a servant. Uh, and um, but they would get a place to live and, and, and something to eat. And so Angeline Palmer grew up uh, um, with a family out in, uh, in, in Belchertown. And that was all, again, perhaps would not stand out in, in history, except for at some point, this family in Belchertown became involved in a business operation in the South. And uh, as a part of that uh, business operation, they, uh, there was communication about them possibly going, going down south. Uh, and if so, to take Angeline with them. Well, to, to do that in the 1840s and to cross that line is to cross into an area where she's no longer a foster child, but she's, she's, she's property. And, um, the, the story was e even told that there, a letter had come and, and was telling them that, you know, you bring her down here, she could fetch $300. Uh, and that's the equivalent of, um, of uh, uh, you know, several thousand in our, in our uh, uh, dollars today. So she could, she could fetch quite a bit that then could go into the, the help of the business, helping their, their silkworm or whatever business uh, survive. 
And so um, as that word gets out and as the date uh, approaches for this family to, to leave it with the plans of taking Angeline Palmer with them down south, uh, an alarm goes out through the community here in Amherst, especially the African-American community. The young girl, Angeline, had a, had a half brother, uh, had a brother that uh, was in town. And, uh, and he's not liking what he's hearing. Um, the, uh, is a grandmother, works for a prominent uh, uh, Amherst family. And, uh, and she's, she's not too, too happy about these plans. Um, and so eventually three individuals, um, including Henry Jackson, decide that they're going to go to Belchertown, take Angeline before she's taken down South. And, um, uh, and this only after they had exhausted all kinds of legal remedies. They went to the select board, they asked the select board, the word went out to town, town meeting members, and, and they're trying to say, look, we don't like what's going on here. Can we, we pull her back from this family and figure out something else for her? And, um, uh, and that becomes, uh, that's, that's rejected, you know, uh, our uh, town government's always got, got, you know, takes forever to, to figure out anything. So uh, even back then, it takes so long to, you know, they're like, ah, no, no, no. Uh, and they then take action. And um, the, with Jackson, they commandeer a, uh, a, a, a carriage. They go to Belchertown. They physically uh, take Angeline into their, in, with them over the objections of the, of the people there and, um, and then hide her out, take her into the underground railroad situation. And, uh, and in fact, as we know from historical accounts, apparently she was hidden out in coal rain, Massachusetts. And this, uh, uh, this story, there is a very tiny write up in the paper of the day about the trial. These, these three are later arrested, um, uh, Jackson and, and Frazier, and actually even a white individual who they, they thought was an accomplice, but later was, was severed from the, from the trial and, and, and later just cleared the charges dismissed, whatever against that person. But uh, the three African-Americans are tried. Uh, they are represented. Uh, 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 apparently pro bono without charge by um, the father of Emily Dickinson. And uh, they will, uh, but he loses, he loses the case and uh, they are found guilty of kidnapping. Uh, and, um, and they are then uh, uh, sentenced uh, to prison. Uh, prison was a little bit different. Apparently they, they could work during the day, just their regular work, but then had to, had to go into quarters at night, into jail jail quarters at night. People could bring them food. They could get other food. It was a you know different kind of arrangement. And apparently, that the the legal decision was not uh, you know fully popular with 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 all of all of Amherst or all of White Amherst. Uh, there was some disagreement about it, and and uh, and so eventually, but they did um, you know have to serve serve some time. Uh, but even afterwards, they're reintegrated right back into the community. And, and in many cases, um, for many people, it, it was a credit to, to Jackson, the way he, the way he stood up, uh, um, particularly in this, in this case, in this cause. Um, but then he further uh, distinguishes himself in the community by answering the call for, for, for troops uh, to once African-Americans are being admitted and uh, goes and serves um, and uh, with the 54th and, and returns and continues to be a very uh, uh, stalwart and upright uh, figure in the, uh, in the community. So um, the, uh, and, and from what we have learned, what is now Railroad uh, Street, little tiny street from, from uh, Route 9 or College uh, on over to, it dead ends before it, it doesn't go all the way to Maine because of the train track. So it kind of dead ends. That little street called Railroad, we understand at one time was named for Henry Jackson. Um, but uh, these are things we're still looking into and, uh, and, and really looking at um, the question of renaming a, a street or a square or something 
in in Amherst for for Henry Jackson. It's uh, uh, and in my survey of uh, of Amherst, uh, there's the, the only uh, uh, historical African American figures acknowledged anywhere is of course on the UMass campus with uh, W. E. B. Du Bois uh, out at Amherst College with some of its uh, alums uh, like uh, Charles Drew. Um, you might have uh, something out there named for him or some marker, but uh, but overall in the town itself, nothing. Just the Julius Lester Trail uh, out by out by uh, um, the the Mill River uh, uh, Park area. That's it. No other no other mention. No other acknowledgement of the historical presence of African Americans in in this town named for. The, uh, the 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 genocidal uh, Jeffrey Amherst. There's absolutely nothing that marks uh, the historical presence of of African Americans on the landscape. But that but things are changing, and one of the areas of change is uh, over in the North uh, uh, Square uh, North Village uh, area uh, on the barn. There is this um, portrait up of Josiah Hasbrook. Uh, the historical photograph of him available at the, in our special collections at the uh, Jones Library uh, is shown here and is then was the, the inspiration or what was used for, for the, uh, the painting that is up on the uh, barn in the North uh, Square Village, acknowledging Josiah Hasbrook. Right around the corner on that same building is also a painting of a living historical figure um, uh, the great uh, Dr. Janetta Cole, who was a faculty member in my department, the W.B. Du Bois uh, Department of Afro-American Studies and the Anthropology Department, who also went into administration and served uh, um, in, with distinction as an administrator here and then went on to serve as the president of two different colleges for women, uh, historically uh, for women of African descent. Uh, Spelman College in Atlanta and, uh, and Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina. So there is also a painting uh, on the same barn of the great uh, Dr. Janetta Cole. But, um, but other than that, we're, it, it's, uh, it's only in our Juneteenth uh, celebrations that something, you know, that, that we begin to kind of raise up uh, these historical figures who fought slavery, who fought uh, in the Civil War, who fought in the Underground Railroad, uh, that we begin to try to raise up these figures. And, and uh, uh, I do encourage more efforts. Uh, there have been other things, uh, the, the um, Emancipation, the Sesqua, was it the um, re Emancipation Proclamation was acknowledged some years back uh, in an event at the, at the town hall. Um, and um, we do have the flag raising uh, annually in, uh, in February in Black History Month. Uh, but, um, but again, there, for this historical, this, when, with this presence of African-Americans um, historically, even while starting uh, in slavery here in, in Western Mass, here in Amherst, um, it, it seems to me a, an act of repair in the spirit of uh, the re reparations that were paid by Newburyport to, to Garrison, how fitting it would be for us to, to have some reparations here for Henry Jackson and for those who, 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 who fought in the Civil War, those who fought in the Underground Railroad and, and paid the price like Henry Jackson uh, uh, for those uh, and, and others like, like uh, Josiah Hasbrook. So with that, I will uh, pause and uh, welcome uh, some questions and, and discussions. Uh, if I can get my cursor, I will stop the sharing of the screen. And uh, and open up for, for your questions. Muted. Okay. Are there questions? Um, I don't see a lot of pictures for people to raise their hands. Um, Let me mention one other uh, uh, 
facet of this that, um, and it concerns the uh, the marble uh, tablets um, that with the uh, inscription with the lettering uh, that honors all of some over 300 uh, men who served in different units in the Civil War and mm -hmm. uh, in that fight. There were different uh, people from this area, uh, about uh, 300 in total, uh, about 21 or so uh, were African Americans. And when that mar when that was done by the uh, uh, back in 1893, it was quite a um, quite a quite an event, and uh, the um, and done at, at great at considerable cost. And yet, um, it's it's rather deplorable that for uh, yeah, almost answer. twenty Just, years now, you want to ask uh, a question? Mm -hmm. we have not seen fit to 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 uh, to have those tablets displayed. This is one one place where we can see see um, you know interracial collaboration for for this country in the form of those who fought in the Civil War. Um, it doesn't it's not to 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 commemorate to celebrate war. It's to celebrate the the people who sacrificed for the defense and of the of the of the country for the uh, um, for the cause that that we uh, not forget the price that people paid and the people who stepped up uh, in service. And yet it continues to languish. And um, uh, last I've heard now is talk about linking the fate of its display to uh, whether we renovate, uh, accept the renovation plans of the Jones Library. I, I just think this is, this is really uh, uh, very wrongheaded and, 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 and really too long for those tablets to be to be just sitting crated up somewhere. So I thought I would throw that in as well. Do you know where the tablets are now? The last we heard, they were in a uh, Department of Public Works <laughs> facility. And, um, and there was some concern because in this same facility, the uh, the snow plows and the and the salt and and all of these kinds of things that are uh, don't sound very um, hospitable or very uh, uh, favorable for the preservation of the of the marble tablets are all in that same uh, uh, facility and um, and that's the last we heard we we had an appointment uh, a small committee of us including descendants of of, uh, of an individual who's on the marble tablet uh, to, we had arranged to go to the facility, but at the last minute that, that date in August was canceled because of um, uh, believing that the, the inside of the facility was just too too dangerous, too- um, Mike isn't uh, the mic on. Not good for us to come there to. There, mic is on. But we've still been waiting. Okay. Um... I think Bill Gillen has a question. Hi, Bill. Hi. Hi. What happened to Evangeline? So uh, Angeline Palmer Angeline. Uh, eventually was able to come out of hiding in cold rain. And um, the, uh, she actually uh, married, uh, got married, had a child of her own. But uh, again, her uh, her economic situation, it seems, was always extraordinarily precarious. And so in the same way her own mother was, uh, um, uh, you know, in the almshouse and, and unable to take care of, of herself and of her daughter, it seems she had a similar fate uh, and uh, was uh, similarly destitute. Don't know what quite happened uh, I think the father was in military service or what have you, but um, she will she she dies pretty young and is um, um, you know not a not a good story about the the economics of uh, of life for uh, for people uh, and for her certainly in those in those times there. All right. And the Belchertown family. Oh. Um, the, um, I think you've had as a guest in for the Amherst Historical Society, I don't know if it was taped as a history bites or, or, or something else, but 
a um, uh, archivist in Belchertown at the Stone House Museum, Cliff oh, yeah. McCarthy. Cliff McCarthy, and, yes, we we have him. Yeah. We have his lecture um, on video. So. On history, as part of History Bites too, or just yep. with the Historical Society. So he he tells that story. Uh, he also has a web page up. If you Google Angeline Palmer, it's uh, it's one of the ones that that comes up. The rescue of Angeline Palmer, and so he he speaks of. Uh, uh, you know, he did considerable research on Mason Shaw and the Shaw family and sort of what what uh, what happens to them. Uh, uh, I think their business venture down south did not quite pan out and and uh, and, and failed. But uh, but yeah, they uh, uh, they they not sure whether they came back to this area or or where they ended up living out. But but Cliff is uh, is probably the person who. Uh, has the most uh, information on that. Cliff is an encyclopedia, yes. It's worth, he is, if you do a web search on um, Angeline Palmer, his page will come up and it has a lot of information. Absolutely. Thank you. So many of us think Angeline is also a, uh, a fitting person and that, that, that whole Underground Railroad uh, rescue is a fitting story to be uh, commemorated in some way here in the town. And again, it brings together a, a lot of the town's history with uh, Emily Dickinson's father um, uh, being uh, the attorney that, that represented the, the three rescuers, the three liberators. Did the Jackson family uh, continue in Amherst? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And uh, the uh, and in fact, the person um, um, that Angeline married was was a Jackson was Sanford Jackson, and um, he um, uh, in Cliff's um, work on this he notes that after Angeline's death he married a second time uh, in 1859 to a uh, to a woman in Wilbraham, but then a year later he married a third time to a Nancy Newport, and where this all came out was that. Um, in his service in the 54th, uh, uh, he's, um, he, he's wounded at the siege of Fort Wagner in South Carolina and uh, uh, dies from his wounds uh, that he incurred there. And so after his death, soldiers are uh, entitled to, uh, the families of soldiers are entitled to a little uh, something from the, from, the, from the military, from the government. And so uh, both of the women, approach the, you know, and, and bring evidence of their marriage <laughs> to this guy. And so little, uh, little uh, story there. But, uh, but before that, his first wife was was Angeline until she mm. until she died. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Shabazz. That was um, very informative. And um, Glad to hear it all. Thank you. Thank you. I have up on screen an article from the Boston Globe from 1893, March 8th, 1893. And uh, this is recording that an article about the town meeting uh, voting uh, to um, it, it, Debuting or uh, the the um, uh, the marble tablets, the memorial tablets, and that was the E.M. Stanton Post 147 of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, that's the the group that uh, came forward uh, to create these marble tablets. They acknowledge uh, 312 Amherst soldiers and sailors, and um, in different slabs. Uh, of marble from, I think, from Vermont. This picture um, is of our town hall, of course. And right here, you see the an area that was built, a, a uh, uh, an encased structure that was built for the display of the tablets. This is from a photograph by the Amherst photographer, Lincoln Barnes, uh, of the town hall in September of 1942. And so the, the 
the marble tablets from Rutland, Vermont were installed were in this. Uh, and it was meant in, it was during the time of the Second World War. So it's meant to to honor the uh, the second, uh, you know, to honor soldiers from a from a from another battle. Here is Dudley Bridges, um, who is a descendant of uh, one of the one of the uh, of persons who fought in uh, from this area. Um, and uh, he's here with photographs of the marble tablets. Uh, Dudley is uh, will will step up during this time to demand that the uh, uh, to work for the display of the tablets to get them to uh, uh, once they had been taken down to be restored and, and cleaned. Um, he began raising money to establish a site for them to be to be posted back up. And, um, and that goes back to uh, uh, um, 20, over 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. And uh, in 2004, he uh, became ill and he passed away at 80 years old, um, having raised money and, uh, and done a lot of work to, to try to get this, the display of the tablets back up. But, uh, but unfortunately, not uh, succeeding. Here is where a picture of where the the tablets are as we know today. This is in the uh, Department of Public Works Ruxton storage facility. They're here inside these these crates in this uh, in this storage facility uh, that we were to visit in August. But again, it was determined that uh, it was too too unsafe to uh, for us to even go in there and, and be able to take a look at the tablets. Mm -hmm.